Hello. Um, up next, we've got a one-on-one -on -one interview between Point Blank founder and CEO Rob Cowan and music industry legend Keith Harris, OBE. Uh, Keith is a music industry legend, having started his own journey, working with legendary labels. A lot of legends involved in this, but it's true. Trans Transatlantic Records, EMI, and Motown before joining Stevie Wonder as his operations manager. Uh, he then started his own management company, looking after some of the best in the business, including soul pioneer Omar and R&B artist Junior Giscom, before being awarded an OBE in 2015 for his services to the music industry. Rob's going to be finding out more about his amazing career, the artists he's managed, and his advice for new artists, musicians, and songwriters in a constantly changing music industry. So please welcome Rob Cowan and Keith Harris, OBE. Woo. Thank, thank you very much, guys, and um, it's great that you're all here. So I've known Keith for, it's um, a bit scary to say it, but over 35 years. Uh, he managed the band I was in, uh, which was a band called Honey Child. Uh, that was in uh, about 1987, 1988. And um, I was, uh, it was a, our publisher introduced me, so I'm gonna try and see if I can help you guys get a record deal. So I'm gonna introduce you to this guy, Keith Harris, could, could be a potential manager. So I said, well, who is this chap? Because well, he manages Stevie Wonder. I go, well, that's good enough for me. Um, so anyway, we met and we, we got on very well and, and we still do. And Keith is on the board at Point Blank in his advice. He's been in the business a long time and had, done lots of, had lots of different roles in the industry. So his advice is very, very welcome. And um, yeah, hopefully we can, um, can learn a bit from, from his experience and, and his advice to you. So, so first question for you, Keith, and thank you for coming. Um, tell me about, you started out in the 70s at Transatlantic Records. So how did you, and then it was EMI, how did you get your first job? How did you get into the industry in the first place? Right, well, first of all, I started out actually in 1970 right. uh, as what was known as Entertainment's Convener for the University of Dundee. Right. Uh, that was the, in, in England, they call them social secretaries. And at that time, loads of people started in the business. That's how they got their first kind of job in the industry. And the, the college circuit, universities, colleges, was the big touring circuit then. So I started off promoting groups right. at that university. Um, and then when I left, I had some friends who were in a group who asked me to manage them. Right. I mean, I hadn't a clue what management was, but I said yes anyway. And um, they didn't make it, probably because the manager hadn't got a clue what he was doing. <laughs> um, so I then got a job in a record company. Right. Uh, so that's, that was my entree to the business. Right. And you um, and when, when you got that role, was it I presume it was a very different environment than it is today. Um, yeah. what, what was it like then? Well, I got a job. My, my job was regional radio promotions. I, I suppose like a lot of people, I had no idea what jobs were available in the industry. And because the group hadn't made it, because the group hadn't made it, so I've got the microphone a bit close. Because the group hadn't made it, I um, decided, yeah, I was going to have to get a job. I wanted to work in the music business. I knew that much. And so I started looking for adverts. I saw an advert in, in what was then the big trade paper in the music industry called Music Week. And it was for a southern regional promotions person. I didn't know what it was, but I thought I might as well go for it. So I went along. The interview, again, again was fairly typical of music business in interviews at that time. And it consisted of the, the guy that was interviewing me saying, so who do you know in the music business? <laughs> and me, me listing either the promoters or the artists or the, the bands that I'd worked with when I was at Dundee. So that's good enough. Right. So, I, so my job was then to go around radio stations in the country to try and get the records played. Right. And at that time, there were only, I think, 12 commercial radio stations in Britain. Right. So this was 1974. Four. Capital Radio came on the air in October, I think, 1974. And um, that was the first pop station. LBC was actually the first station. So I was touring around the radio stations, but there were so few right. that it was, it was just a very different environment. Right. And um, so you then um, you went on to work at Motown. Was that, mm. follow, that was following that? Now, was that, was that here or was that in the US? No, it, it was here originally. What happened was... 
again, and this will give you an idea of how things were and how things have changed. I was working at Transatlantic Records, which for those of you who know London well, was a number 86 Marlebone High Street, right? And I fell out with the general manager of, of the label. So I walked to the nearest record company, which was EMI Records, which was at number 9 Fair Street, which is the, the bottom of Marlebone High Street. And I said, I'm looking for a job. And they said, what do you do? I said, I do radio promotions. And they said, oh, well, um, actually, funnily enough, the guy that does promotions for Motown is just about to leave. I don't think he knows it yet, but he's just about to leave. So yeah. would, but, you, <laughs> <laughs> would you be interested in, in working at Motown? So I naturally enough said, well, yeah, why not? Yeah. And I ended up getting the job as head of promotions for Motown. And did that involve you then going over to the US to work at Motown? Or? No, it, what happens initially, I was dealing with the Motown artists coming into the UK. Right. So whenever an artist came over, you know... So, so who job. were those artists? Who, did, who, was, who was coming over at the time? Well, the, the first one that I remember coming in was, was an artist called Smokey Robinson. Yeah. And then um, I think after that, the Supremes came in and the Commodores, and Rick James, and the Four Tops. Amazing artists. And, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and then in 1977, I was actually on tour. I was in Manchester, funnily enough, uh, with Smokey Robinson. And I got a phone call from EMI Records, the Motown office, saying, we need you to come back down to London. And I'm going, well, when? So, well, now. I said, well, I can't, because I've got Smokey on tonight. It was, it was a sound check time. And they said, no, no, just apologize to Smokey and leave and come. And I'm saying, well, what's the big deal? And they said, well, Stevie Wonder's coming into London tonight. Right. And he wants to go out somewhere. And we don't know where to take him. Because I was the person. You were the man about town, were you? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so I drove back down to London. I met Stevie in, in uh, it would have been October 1977. Right. So you actually met over here? Yeah, get, yeah right. exactly. And we right. just got on really well. Okay, because that, that was my, kind of one of my questions is, how did you transition from, <laughs> you, it was, that's how you met him, and yeah. you just hit it off. We got on really well. And then, to be perfectly honest, through, I don't want to sort of um, bring the tone down. That's okay. But, but basically, <laughs> through what was basically racism, it was made obvious to me that I wasn't going to make any more progress. Right. Uh, at the EMI Motown office. That's so interesting. So I called Stevie, who'd been talking to me about going to work with him, and said, are you serious about that? I said, yeah. So I moved to LA in 1978. Right. It was funny, I was, I was going to get onto this subject of things you, you brought it up about, you know, racism in the industry, and you, yeah. you've been quite open in saying that you had experienced direct and indirect racism. Yeah. Um, could, you, could you kind of expand on that and some of the obstacles? And, and was it different here compared to the, the US? It yeah. was a different type or, or worse degrees? Well, I'll explain. What happened was that when I started Motown, like I said, I was head of promotions. And then I got called into the managing director's office at EMI. Uh, and he said, uh, Alan, the guy called Alan Fitter, who was, who was the general manager, has just handed in his notice. And he said, it might seem to a lot of people that you'd be an obvious choice to take the general manager's job. So I'm just calling you in to tell you I'm not going to give it to you, so don't bother to apply. Right. So I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> so you put two and two so, together. Yeah, and, no, 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 he said, I'm going to go for somebody with more experience. So I thought, okay, well, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't that experienced in the business. So the guy left, calls me into his office again. He says, oh, look, we haven't found anybody to replace Alan Fitter. Will you take the general manager's role? So I said, okay. So I took on the role, I did it for three, four months. And right as I, I just had, a, there's a record called Three Times a Lady by the Commodores that came out just when I was, uh, you know, Great record, on the cusp. Yeah. Right. And it was actually, it turned out to be Motown's biggest selling single to date. Wow. And that week, he calls me into the office and he goes, we found somebody to take the general manager's job. So, uh, you go back to promotions. Oh, he's not that experienced. So if you can kind of look over his shoulder and help him out, you know, while he settles in. Oh, so I so said, that's not happening. Yeah, right. <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was the end of that, yeah, was it? Yeah. So, yeah. So, and, I, and, so I moved to LA. Right. And did you, did you find in LA there were more, it was 
I wouldn't say easier, but more opportunities or less, less was there less racism? Did you? No, well, the, the industry is different there because the industry was separated. You know, there, was a, there was a black music industry and there was a white music industry, which they called pop right. and R&B then. Right. Um, so what happened was that the, um, the racism was kind of, kind of almost institutionalized, if you like. So if you, had a, if you were a black artist making what was effectively a pop record, you had to break it at black radio first, right? And then maybe cross it over right. into the pop music marketplace. So when I went to America, I was working for Stevie and he had an office in the Motown building. Right? So we actually had two offices. We had one office at 6255 Sunset Boulevard, which was where, Steve, where the Motown office was. But Steve had his own office as well at 9,000 Sunset. Right. So I was kind of in backwards before, right. between the two. But, but in Motown, obviously, it was a black record company. So I mean, you didn't experience it within that environment? Well, they, it was a black record company. They happened to have uh, a president who was white, head of promotions who was white, right. uh, head of sales who was white. <laughs> so it was a very, you know, it, was a, it was a strange yeah. environment. Yeah. You know, but what happened, and I th this is what I found unusual and very different from the UK, was that you know, everybody kind of worked together in the office. But then as soon as everybody left the office, everybody went back to their own communities. Right. And there was, there was no kind of real mixing. Right, quite you segregated. Know? Yeah. If I went, if we went down to, say, to Venice Beach, there'd be like a basketball game. Well, there'd be three or four basketball games. There'd be courts down there. Right. But there'd be one court that had all white players right. and another court that had all black players. But there were no right. black players in the white game and no white players. Right. No, it was, it was, it this was, was America at the time. Yeah, exactly. And, and there was nothing formal. There was nothing to say you couldn't do that. Just that's what people did. Yeah, but that's, that's how it was. Right. It's very interesting. And tell me about, um, you know, man managing, I mean, you still manage Stevie Wonder. Well, we work well, together. I mean, he we doesn't do that much, right. so there's not a lot of management goes on. But, but what's the what's the secret to this sort of the, the longevity? Is it just the fact you got on so well, or you know, in terms of the business? Obviously, it's a business relationship as well as a you know, the music industry is also very much the personal and the business tends yeah. to cross over. But um, I think it's a few things. I think first of all, you know, we're about the same age, right? He's actually a year older than me, which I right. keep, <laughs> keep reminding you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're about the same age. When we first met, you know, we had so much in common in spite of our totally different backgrounds. You know, I was born in Newcastle, yeah. raised in the north. Yeah. Uh, he was born in Detroit, uh, in Saginaw in Michigan and raised in Detroit. But we had so much in common. And so initially we were friends. Then because of what happened at Motown here, yeah, I was his employee. But for uh, the three or four years that I was there, you know, I basically worked with him pretty much around the clock. Right. So I traveled with him, you know, so we became very close. And in fact, what happened was that I suddenly realized, did you ever see James Brown? I never had the, uh, okay. I was never fortunate <laughs> enough to, to well, see him, unfortunately. J James Brown, at the end of his set, right, he used to do a song called Please Don't Go. This is his, his kind of closing number. And as he walked off the stage, this guy would come with a cape. Oh, uh, yeah, I've seen this on TV, yeah. yeah. Throw it over his shoulders yeah. and pat him on the back as he went off. And he'd get to the side and throw the cape off and come back. Right? Yeah. And I remember when I went to see James Brown, somebody was saying, see that guy with a cape? You know, that's the same guy that's been doing that with James Brown with his cape since so 1968 right. or whatever. And I just had this vision that somebody was going to say, See that guy with Stevie Wonder? <laughs> He's been with him. Yeah, yeah well, it's, when it's yeah. come true. So, it's, well, no, but I actually, that's why I actually left LA and came back to London. Right. Because I thought, well, you know, we still get on, we work together really well, but I don't really just want to be ah, I see. that guy right. who puts a cape over Stevie Wonder's shoulders. Right. Um, and so you know, I, I wanted to try and carve something out for myself. So that's why I came back originally. Right. And, and, when you came back, was that, was that the 80s then when you... I came back in 1982, and then, right to the end of 82. And then were you, I think you've also mentioned you found it difficult to get work. Uh, or, or... No, well, 
I think what you, you're referring to, I, I wrote the, this open letter to the music industry, and, yeah. and, and I said it, in it, it wasn't so much I found it difficult to get work, what I said was that when I came back to London in 1982, I reckon that had I been a white executive coming back to London, having managed Stevie Wonder in LA for nearly four years, right. somebody might have offered me a job in the industry. Right. Right. But it never happened. Right. right? I got offered uh, to be a partner by Barry Marshall, who was a promoter from a company called Martial Arts. Right. And that was the only job offer that I got when I came back right. to the UK. So I then worked for myself. In, uh, the next job offer I got in the industry was 25 years later. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all I was saying was that it was, I, I believe there was a big difference in the way that I was treated compared to how I would have been treated yeah. had I been you know, a white executive coming back to London, having worked successfully in LA you know, yeah. for, for that time. And I, and I read that lesson, you said you weren't complaining, you were happy, but you wanted to make a point. Yeah. And, and this was off the back of, it was really after the death of George Floyd. And yeah. there was a thing called was the Blackout Initiative, as one day, it was about sort of being aware and you called for it not just to be one day, but to, yeah. you know, that we should be an ongoing thing. Do you feel since you, you wrote that letter, there's, you've, you've, there's been changes? Do you think that that has, you've seen that there's, there's been some progress? Yeah, I mean, I'll, if, I, if I go back and I, rem I remember the, the Blackout Tuesday. And the reason I remember it was because the day before, I got a phone call from one of my sons, who's an artist manager. And he said to me, what are you doing for Blackout Tuesday? I said, what do you mean? Right. <laughs> he said, well, you know, Blackout Tuesday. I said, well, you know I have no social media at right. all. <laughs> I've got so, nothing to black so, out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He said, well, you, you know, you've got to do something. He, he said, you've talked to, to us about this all our lives. You know, maybe you could write a letter to Lucian Grange, who's the chairman of Universal or whatever, uh, you know, and, and say something. So I said, okay, well, what I'll do is I will write an open letter to the captains of the music industry about my experience and say that I hope that it's going to be better for the next generation coming through. Right? And, that, and that's how that came about. Right. And since then, yeah, there have been some you know, significant initiatives right. you know, that, that I think are making a difference. Because you know, we, we needed things that were going to really move the dial. Because everybody came forward we'll put in 100,000, we'll do this, we'll do that. But what was worrying me was, obviously there's a lot of emotion, it was a, a really kind of um, politically charged moment. And I've seen that come and go before. Right. And I was worried that everybody would say that and then nothing would happen, yeah. right? But actually there have been some really good initiatives and, and some really good programs put in place. And it actually changes, I'm not saying racism has gone away because it clearly hasn't, right? But it changes the way that people look at things and people do things. There's a friend of mine who, who's he's actually a martial arts instructor, right? And he was telling me that one of the schools that he teaches at had called him up and said, oh, we want to pay you for the, for the school holidays. And they'd never done this before, right? right? And it's, it just made people reassess the difference in the way they treated people. Right. Right, because he's, he's, he's a black instructor. Right. They're teaching in mainly white schools. Right. And whereas the other teachers, you know, got paid through the holidays, I he see. had never actually been paid for the holidays. So it made people reevaluate and reassess. And I think, you know, it, there's been a bit of black backsliding. But at the end of the day, pretty much everything in society has been affected by that. Yeah. You know, people have actually started to say, well, actually, we need to make some changes around here. Right. If you look at sort of presenters on television or presenters in radio, and, and it would be almost impossible now to do the kinds of shows that you used to do with, you know, an all-white yeah. audience, all-white panel. You know, so that those are the changes that, in the long term, will make a difference. Yeah. So it's it's generally it's 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 not just in the music industry; it's also in in yeah. society as well. Exactly. So so if you were you starting now, do you feel that there would be, you know, if you're talking about a young student, a young black student at Point Blank, for example, mm. 
do you think it would be it wouldn't have the same obviously there's always difficulties getting into the yeah. music industry but perhaps wouldn't experience quite the the barriers to entry that, that you might have faced or, or do you think they're just different or I, th I think that some of the barriers have been lowered but not removed. Right, okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> right, it's a slight, it's moving in the right direction but not, not obviously where it needs to be. We now have, you know, a couple of black chairmen of record companies, which there weren't before. Right. right? There are several black executives in the music industry now. Whereas, you know, when I joined EMI, you can count the black executives on one finger. Right. Okay. So, so it's, it was, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. We're not obviously where we need to be, but yeah. we're closer than where, we, where it was in the 70s well, and the 80s. Well, it's now the fingers of one hand. Right. Okay. So that's <laughs> a, it's a start in the... Um, you would tell me, I, I want to talk about just this slightly light, um, amusing story. You told me about once when Stevie was over here yeah. and he ended up, she had nowhere to stay one night and he had to stay in stayed in your house in right, Collier's Wood. Except on my floor, yes. Yeah, and, and then... And, I wouldn't give him the bed. Right. <laughs> and then you were, you were coming out in the morning, and do you, do you remember that story yeah, you were yeah, telling well, me? Yeah, so I do remember, because I, what had happened, actually, it was, it, I'll tell you why that had happened. What had happened was that he was, he was editing the album that I just called Say I Love You was on, right? And we were in Spain, and it was a Sunday, and he was carrying with him the editing equipment, the digital editing equipment, and it didn't work. Right. And he promised Barry Gordy, the boss of Motown, that he would definitely deliver the record you know, this week. Right. So it was a real pressure situation. And I managed to find a classical recording studio called Chandos in London that had the same equipment. And it was Sunday, so we managed to book the studio in London from, I think, midnight till 4 a.m. Right, one of those. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we had to fly in from Madrid, go to Chandos, went to the studio, Stevie did the edit, and then we had a flight back to Madrid to tell a show in Madrid the following night. Right. So we had, okay. to, we had to fly back to Madrid. It's quite tight then, yeah. <laughs> at, at 7 o'clock in the morning. Right. Said, well, it's not worth getting a hotel. You know, so you stay at my place. What I was actually thinking was, if you get a hotel, I'm going to have to get up really early and go and to get, get into him. London. Go and get, get. Yeah. So I said, but if you stay at my place, we'll just go from it. So, so, he, so he stayed at my place. and we went down. So, of course, coming out the door in the morning, it was really early, it was six o'clock in the morning, and the milkman was delivering the milk. Right. So I come out of the house with Stevie Wonder on my arm. <laughs> yeah. I get in the car. And off we go, and you can see the milkman thinking, what? I'm yeah, he must, he must have had quite a surprise. But, he did, but the thing is, he didn't see me for probably another six weeks we were on tour. Right. So six weeks later, yeah, I come out of the house, the Milton's there. He said, when I saw you a few weeks ago, coming out of the house, what's that? Who I thought it was coming out? I said, well, it depends who you thought it was. Yeah. yeah. He said, I thought it looked like Stevie Wonder. I said, yeah, it was. Uh, that's, that's said, so oh, I wanted to tell the guys in the depot, but I didn't dare tell yeah. them. That was so stupid. That's amazing. So I can tell them now. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so you, you've also, you know, been involved in education. So you, you, I think you devised and taught and ran the, the music business course at Westminster uh, University, and also you've been involved in helping Point Blank write music business courses. How do you sort of transition into the into the world of education? Did you kind of fall into it? Was it was it well, a choice, or how, how did that happen? Like pretty much everything else I've done, it was an accident. Right. Okay. Somebody. Somebody had asked me if I would be an advisor to the first music industry course that was being devised in, at the University of Westminster. And I said yes. So I was in, on what they call the professional advisory panel. And the idea behind those panels is that because it's a vocational degree course, people don't really know what you should have when you come out of it. So we were kind of advising the people who were writing the course about what should have been. You know, right. And I did that. It was just a sort of free couple of afternoons. And then I forgot about it. About a year, a year later, the guy called me up and said, look, we've, we've been running the course for a year now. Do a little celebration. Will you come along? So I went along and he was saying, so how's it going? You know, this new course. So it was the first 
honours degree in commercial music at the University of Westminster. And he said, well, it's going okay, except the music business module, there's some people, you know, some of the students are feeling they're not really getting the real deal because they were using the lecturers from the Harrow Business School to teach the music business. Right. And obviously they know about business, but the music business is quite specific. So he said, so, you know, do you know anybody who might kind of come along and make it feel a bit more real? Yeah. So because I'm a manager, I said, how much does it pay? <laughs> and they told me, and I said, well, to be perfectly honest, I don't know anybody who's prepared to work. Academic money is not good in this country. I don't know really anybody who's prepared to right. work for that kind of money. And, and then I went home and I thought, you know what? One of the big barriers that have been put up to me for black employment in the industry, because you know, people have been, for years and years I've been complaining about the lack of employment. And people said, well, if we could find somebody who's suitably qualified, you know, black people who are suitably qualified, we would employ them. But there weren't any qualifications. Right. So I thought about that. I thought, well, actually, here is a degree course in commercial music, right? And I will, if I teach on this, then there are going to be people coming through qualified. Right. right? So I called the guy back and said, look, you know, if you can accept the fact that I'm a manager first and a lecturer second, and if you can pay just a little bit more so it's not actually insulting, <laughs> then I'll, I'll give it a shot. Right. So I ended up going to, to, to teach uh, two afternoons a week on this honours degree in commercial music. But then I had to kind of rewrite all the modules right. because they didn't really work. Right. So I, and I ended up teaching on there for... 16 years. Wow, yeah. so I didn't realize it had been that, that long. But then they, they, gave, they made the mistake of giving me an honorary doctorate. Right. So when they <laughs> made, made me Dr. Keith Harrison, then I left. Right. <laughs> um, so this is, I mean, obviously you've had, you must have seen a lot of students come and go and, and, and seeing them, you know, some of them, hopefully a lot of them go into the industry and obviously yeah. you've been involved in helping with us with our music industry courses. And one of the questions that, always gets asked, and I'm sure a lot of you have asked this, artists that are out there, how many, how many artists are, are in, like, DJs, producers? A lot, right? Mm -hmm. So a question that always gets asked, and it's a really good question, is mm -hmm. when's the right time to get a manager? I know there's no fixed answer, but can you give any guidance as to, to if you're an artist, obviously a student starting off on your career, you've recently graduated, you know, is there any sort of indicators that you, you could give that would be helpful? Yeah, well, the thing is, the industry's changed a lot. And there are things like this. So people kind of find out a little bit of how it works. So most artists can do quite a lot for themselves, right? Uh, most artists have, have um, you know, they get some kind of an, an, an idea of how the business works. There's stuff online, and, you know, so you get a certain amount of information. So you can take things to a certain point. The thing is that, first of all, there are two mindsets. I mean, somebody explained this to me once. They said, look, you have to understand two things about artists. Yeah. They have, think of them like a computer motherboard, right? And on their motherboard, they have two chips that we don't have, right? The chips are talent, and creativity, right? Unfortunately, in order to make way for those two chips, because the motherboard is only a finite size, they had to take two chips out, right? And those two chips are logic <laughs> and gratitude. <laughs> so, yeah, it kind of made me understand about the artist's mindset, right? So what happens is, when you're doing stuff for yourself as an artist, what will happen? There will be a point where you find that doing the business side of it starts to get in the way of the creativity. Yeah. We would be on stage halfway through a song and you think, oh God, I didn't call that guy back. <laughs> you know, or did I invoice for that? <laughs> you know, and when that starts happening, maybe you need some help. Right. right? So it's kind of when things start to feel they become a bit overwhelming and you can't manage the, when, the business elements? 
when the business is getting in the way of the creativity, right, then you know you, you should try and get some help. And you know it it can actually be somebody because this is the other the, the other big thing that tends to happen is as an artist you you hear about or you see these these big managers uh, and you oh I want that person now it might happen but actually it's much more likely that there'll be somebody in your network you know who is disposed to doing the manager's job right and at the early stages you're probably better off working with them than trying to get you know a really busy major manager to get involved who basically hasn't got the time yeah so it could be people if people on a production course they could see if they're on the music industry course there'll be people there so actually look towards your peers when you're getting started because they're going to have a bit more time and yeah. and dedication yeah. rather than uh you know be split in so many directions and same thing happens at events like this because you know at an event like this there are probably people in the room who aspire to be managers you ask them who are artists oh, let's ask the next question <laughs> any people that want to go into the industry the management side of things not as many but some yeah it's okay well so your artists need to find those people that put their hands up that well, want to exactly. be in the, in the business side well that's exactly it because obviously if you want to be a manager you have to find people to manage right? yeah and if you want to be an artist and look for management start with somebody who really wants to get it i'm okay the learning the ropes they might make some mistakes but we all make mistakes i still make big <laughs> mistakes i'm not going to tell you what they are <laughs> uh, you know so it, it it makes sense to try and tap into the people you know at your level brilliant now i don't know how we are doing for time but i think we're probably have we got time for got time for any questions or we need to we're done okay well i think we're, we're done. i think we're done thank, thank you a big round of applause for keith harris obe <laughs>